You're listening to episode 40 of the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with Lily Nichols, RDN, all about the myths and misconceptions about prenatal nutrition that need to be busted so you can have the healthiest pregnancy possible. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm a registered dietitian and coach trained in functional medicine with a passion for helping women just like you ditch perfectionism and use food, fitness, and self-care to fuel your bigger God-given purpose. I believe that it's possible to achieve your biggest life-changing goals without the frustration, obsession, or negative self-talk that so many women subject themselves to every day. All you need are the right tools, the right mindset, and the faith to turn your dreams into reality. I'm here to guide you along the way. The truth is that you are so much more than a body, and I'm on a mission to help you change the way you think and act at a core beliefs level so you can transform your physical, mental, and spiritual health from the inside out. Are you ready to become fed and fearless in your pursuit of a healthy, meaningful life? Welcome to the Fed and Fearless Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, I'm your host as always, and we have a really special guest for you today who I actually got requested to have on the show multiple times when I asked you all who you wanted to see um, appear as a guest on the show. So it's gonna be a really important episode for anybody who is thinking about getting pregnant or um, has a friend or family member that's thinking about getting pregnant. And I say thinking about getting pregnant because even though the topic of this podcast is prenatal nutrition, we're really talking primarily about preconception nutrition and the choices that you wanna consider making before you even get pregnant in the first place. So I'm super excited to have with me today, Lily Nichols. She's a registered dietitian nutritionist, certified diabetes educator, researcher, and author with a passion for evidence-based prenatal nutrition. Drawing from the current scientific literature and the wisdom of traditional cultures, her work is known for being research-focused, thorough, and sensible. Her best-selling book, Real Food for Gestational Diabetes, presents a revolutionary nutrient-dense lower-carb approach for managing gestational diabetes. Her work has not only helped tens of thousands of women manage their gestational diabetes, but has also influenced nutrition policies internationally. Her second book, Real Food for Pregnancy, is an evidence-based look at the gap between conventional prenatal nutrition guidelines and what's optimal for mother and baby. Lily's clinical expertise and extensive background in prenatal nutrition have made her a highly sought after consultant and speaker in the field. Lily is also the creator of the popular blog, lilynicholsrdn.com, which explores a variety of topics related to real food, mindful eating, and pregnancy nutrition. So Lily has a very similar mindset that I do when we're combining not only scientific information and evidence-based nutrition knowledge, but also combining that with the wisdom of traditional cultures. As you'll find out in this interview, sometimes it's not as black and white as having um, research to support every single recommendation that we make. Unfortunately, as you all may know by now, the world of women's health research is sorely lacking when it comes to studies and funding for those studies and all of that, that would allow us to have a better understanding of female physiology and especially pregnancy and prenatal physiology. So I just love Lily's approach, her mindset with all of this. And our goal throughout this whole episode is to help you make informed decisions about how you want to proceed preparing for a pregnancy, whether you've already had a child or you are wanting to have your first child or having a child might be years in the future or maybe not even on your radar right now. So we want you to be able to have confidence in the decisions you're making. We don't want any decisions to be made out of fear or confusion or misinformation. So um, we talked about a lot of really cool different studies that Lily has come across and different 
different experience that both of us have had working with clients. Um, I hope that this episode will inspire you to learn more about prenatal nutrition and to check out Lily's book, which is a wealth of information as well. Just enjoyed the episode that we put together. Unfortunately, we did not get anywhere near close to finishing all the questions I wanted to ask Lily because we had so much to cover, but hopefully I'll have her on on the show again in the future. But for now, I hope you enjoy our conversation. And without further ado, here is Lily Nichols. All right, everybody. I'm super excited to have with me today my first, I would say, requested guest from my audience. Um, as this is a new podcast, a lot of people have uh been starting to listen and starting to get a little bit more of a routine. And I finally got some requests for people to bring on the show. And Lily was somebody who was mentioned like, I don't know, five times or something. So um, definitely an exciting guest to have. And I know a lot of you out there are excited to have her as well. So welcome to the show, Lily Nichols. Thank you for having me, Laura. I'm excited that people want to hear from me. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I know you were a guest on our original podcast, like a million years ago. I think you were one of the first guests on the show. And so um, that was a very popular episode. So I know this one will be as well. Now, something that I would love to hear from you is a little bit about your journey to becoming an expert in the field of prenatal nutrition. I think when we had interviewed you the first time, you may have still been under the Pilates nutritionist brand, possibly. That would have been like 2014, I think. So um it was a while back. Um, but so I know that there's been a journey that you've gone through to get to a place where now you're really heavily focused on prenatal nutrition and postnatal nutrition for mom and baby. So just real quick, how did you get to a place where this was something that was such a passion and a focus of yours? So I'm trying to figure out how to keep this as brief as possible. Because <laughs> I know it's been probably like 10 years or something of a, a journey yeah, that you've been on. We have long stories, but Yes. Originally, my brand was Pilates Nutritionist, PilatesNutritionist.com. And, you know, when I came out of my dietetic internship, I um, did not want to work at a hospital for reasons that both you and I can um, probably agree on and went into Pilates teacher training. And that was um, something that I started doing as sort of like a side hustle while I was also doing nutrition consulting. And so I was a bit of a jack of all trades for, I don't know, five years <laughs> um, when I was a new dietitian where I was doing nutrition consulting. I was teaching Pilates. I was doing nutrition workshops. I was um, consulting with the California Diabetes and Pregnancy Program. Then I started working clinically under a perinatologist doing gestational diabetes primarily, but also anything prenatal nutrition focused. So a, a heavy um, clinical focus on that part. But I was really like managing a million hats, doing everything part time. And um, at the time, uh, most of my private clients, so outside of like the conventional clinical setting, most of my private clients were people who are doing Pilates. So at the time it made sense for my brand to be Pilates nutritionist. I do nutrition workshops out of Pilates studios. And it was like, a, um, you know, people who do Pilates generally are pretty wellness focused. Um, it wasn't until I actually decided to write real food for gestational diabetes to put out essentially what I was doing in practice that was working far better than what the conventional guidelines were telling me to do. Um, I decided to write that book and get that out there to a broader audience that that started to become at least on a professional level, like private practice level, a bigger focus of my practice and a, um, a bigger draw for my clientele. A lot of my work just sort of naturally shifted towards prenatal nutrition. And then of course, becoming pregnant myself and now having gone through, you know, two pregnancies and now I have real food for pregnancy, my other book, it just has sort of naturally sort of taken over my focus, um, as a professional. So yeah, so I rebranded to lilynicholsrdn.com and sort of dropped my um, my old brand because it just didn't fit anymore. I don't teach Pilates anymore. <laughs> I focused almost exclusively on prenatal nutrition. And I think because, you know, I've had experience from so many different angles to answer the second part of your question of like, how do you become a specialist, I hate the word expert, but how do you, did you become a specialist in prenatal nutrition and sort of like known for your work in that? Um, I think part of that is because I've 
seen the prenatal nutrition field from so many angles. I've seen it from the public policy angle. I've seen it from the clinical angle, the private practice angle, consulting on research projects with evidence-based birth and other people. I've seen it from so many angles that I just, it's just sort of where my energy gravitates and being in the stage of life where I'm childbearing. I currently have, you know, a four-year-old and a seven-month-old infant. It also sort of fits um, on a personal level as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy to call you an expert, even if you won't (laughs) use the term yourself. So, um, and I think, you know, there's a reason that so many people requested to have you on the show. And the fact that in a lot of the um, Facebook communities that I'm in for different dietetics groups, whenever somebody's asking about prenatal nutrition resources, I think your book is probably one of the top recommendations that they have. So that's good. To um, hear. You, you've done a great job of uh, just doing the research and being, you know, on top of, like you said, all the different angles that people can take when it comes to prenatal nutrition. So, um, Now, we will definitely focus on prenatal nutrition for this conversation. If you guys want to hear Lily again in the future, there's a lot that she has to share about other things. Like I know you have um, some guidelines around feeding infants, that kind of thing. But we're going to focus on prenatal nutrition because um, I think it is a topic that, like you said, there's a lot of misinformation, um, both in women that are thinking about pregnant as well as women that already are pregnant. So I would love to hear from you since you work with so many women and you probably communicate with a lot of women about prenatal nutrition. What are some of the common myths that women are unfortunately believing about prenatal nutrition? Oh gosh. And we could talk for a whole hour just on that one question. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I bet. I think, I think some of the, the, Biggest myths and also side note, like biggest frustrations are the focus on what to avoid. Like there's this idea that you need to avoid all these foods in your pregnancy. So like you get pregnant, you get the positive test. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is actually happening. And then it's like, okay, what can't I do instead of what should I do more of? Um, so there tends to be a bit of like a, a fear-based mentality about eating during pregnancy. Um, Hey, fitting for the name of your podcast, right? It's exactly what I wanted to talk about. So, yeah. So I I think most people get pretty overwhelmed by all the things they should avoid eating. And if you look up on the internet, which foods to avoid when you're pregnant, you'll get a pretty long list. Some are longer than others. And most of them relate to food safety. There's a couple that relate to toxins. Like there's some specifics on what fish types of fish or seafood are safe in pregnancy and which ones might be high mercury, but most of them really are around food safety. And so um, that is one of the, I don't know if I want to call it a myth, but it's, it's something that I want to give people a little more information so they can make, you know, an informed choice. I can't guarantee any food is safe or unsafe, but a a lot of what I do, there's a whole section in chapter four of real food for pregnancy um, where I go through this sort of weighing the risk benefit equation of different foods. So how likely are you to get sick from, for example, eggs with runny yolks. And then if you choose to avoid that food entirely, um, say you're, you're a person who only likes eggs with runny yolk. So you won't eat them if they're like, quote, not safe. Then what are the potential nutritional downsides of not including any eggs in your diet? I think that's a discussion that doesn't happen. I think people are just given this blank, can't eat this, can't eat that, can't eat that, bar none, no discussion around it. And I also like to play devil's advocate in that, what are the foods that are most likely to actually make you sick? Which ones are linked to the most foodborne illness outbreaks, at least in the United States. And that's actually raw fruits and vegetables. 46% of the foodborne outbreaks in the U S are raw fruits and vegetables, but nobody tells you not to eat a salad. Nobody tells you not to eat raw fruit. Um, So it's kind of like, it's just, I think it's, we're sort of left in this frustrating quandary of, who do you believe? And again, I can't guarantee that your egg with runny yolks for sure doesn't contain salmonella, but I can tell you the chances it's contaminated is anywhere between one in 12,000 to one in 30,000. So, and the egg, egg related foodborne illness outbreaks only account for 2% of those in the whole U S. So 
you have to just make the choice. Is that a risk that I want to take or is that not a risk I want to take? And that's, I think, uh, probably one of the biggest myths that I am, you know, providing more information around is just food safety as a whole. You let me know if you want me to go into more because there is many, many more I could choose. Yeah, well, I think, like you said, it's definitely relevant to the overall theme of the podcast since my the work I do in general is helping women really take the fear out of food decisions. And many times fear comes from either misinformation or, um, you know, taking information too far. Like you said, egg yolks, if somebody wants to be extra, extra safe, they can cook them thoroughly and, you know even if you don't like it that way, if you want to be really, really safe, but also, like you said, looking at the different risks and saying, okay, if you're going to eat spinach and strawberry salad, maybe you're okay to have um, well, some ready egg yolks too. Just as concerned about food safety with those foods as you should your other foods, I think is an important mm-hmm. thing to point out. Yeah. Yeah. So I think as far as understanding myths or just misconceptions, because again, I think the food safety thing is, it's not that it's bad to be aware. It's just that if that's all you're focusing on, you're going to miss out on like, especially with eggs, I'm sure you'll, you'll explain like the choline connection and everything. Um, but just understanding we can only make so many choices with our diet and we have limited brain power. All of us do. And we have limited attention, limited energy, limited budget potentially. And we don't want people to be foregoing really important nutritional, um, foods, nutrition, high quality, real food to, you know, avoid something that's very unlikely to happen. So, um, so are there any other, like I said, myths or misunderstandings that may affect a woman's ability to nourish herself well during a pregnancy? Well, I think another one, I don't know if I'd call this a myth, but I think there's an unspoken understanding maybe that the conventional guidelines are, correct. They're always right. They shouldn't be challenged. Um, so I I think people come at it as people are very afraid about making it, doing anything different than what the guidelines say. But again, sort of playing devil's advocate. One of the things I like to point out is that it takes a long time for research to make it into clinical practice on average, it's 17 years and even longer for it to get into public policy. Um, and having worked in public policy, at least in a very tiny, tiny um, side of it with the California Diabetes and Pregnancy Program, I can attest to there are a lot of like bureaucratic blockades in place that prevent this new research from making it into practice. And so for me, when I look at the guidelines and look at the data, because I'm just always reading always reading the research. It's like my favorite hobby, which sounds really weird, but I enjoy reading new research and seeing what's out there. You can see there's a lot of studies that have come out that have sort of questioned whether our guidelines are where they should be. So one of the, one of the studies I like to give an example of is um, from 2015, and it was the first ever study that directly estimated protein requirements in pregnant women. First ever. So prior to 2015, in other words, all of our estimates on how much protein a pregnant woman needs are based on pretty much data, mostly from adult men, um, not directly relating to pregnancy. So this was like a pretty groundbreaking study. And they found that in late pregnancy, which they defined as greater than 31 weeks, the um, protein requirements were actually 73% higher than the current estimated average requirement. So that's, that actually, maybe, I mean, I think that's a big finding, but when you think about it in the context of how we sort of create pregnancy recommendations and what goes into these sample meal plans and the caloric breakdown and all the macronutrients, a 73% higher protein requirement means that the rest of the recommendations, the carb and fat percentages are also off. Right. Um, So this has big implications for everything. Not only that, but when you start to look at the micronutrients, protein foods tend to be also really dense in micronutrients as well. And so that might pull into question a lot of the micronutrient requirements. If protein needs are actually higher and you're eating more protein, you're probably eating more of many different micronutrients as well. And we do have data on 
say choline, for example, um, which is you know spread out throughout the food supply, but is most concentrated in foods like egg yolks or liver, and generally foods of animal origin just have um, a larger um, content of choline relative to the amount of food. They're just more concentrated in, in uh, choline. They found that the choline requirements are actually probably a lot higher than what the estimated requirement is by about double because when you look at how they set the choline requirements it was based on data from adult men and an amount of choline that would reverse fatty liver disease it wasn't looking at like what's optimal so now we have this really broad base of data on choline and its role in brain development and placental health and um, liver health and it's just so much that's saying, hey, we need a lot more. Now, if you get the choline off, you get the protein off, we have B12 that's, that's now shown we need actually triple what the RDA is. It just brings into question the entirety of the guidelines. So I just want, want to make people aware that like research is always changing. And so if you have a prenatal nutrition book that isn't citing research or the recommendations just don't align with what you have come to learn about food, especially, you know, on the real food and more nutrient dense side of things. Um, you might be right to be sort of smelling something fishy because there is a lot of data that has come out to show that maybe these guidelines could be updated to be a, a, a bit more evidence based. I feel like you're saying this so kindly. <laughs> like <laughs> You're just like, maybe we could update these perhaps. And I'm thinking to myself like, oh my gosh, this is horrible that they haven't really taken this stuff into account. Um, and maybe I'm a little bit more, uh, I don't know, a little bit more sassy than you are when I hear this kind of stuff, because immediately there's two things that come to mind when you're mentioning this. One is the fact that women's health in general is so poorly researched. And, you know, there's so much that it, women are being told that it's based on male anatomy and physiology. Um, and then I, and, and I get this, I understand that testing pregnant women for anything adds a whole level of complexity when it comes to actual research, doing intervention studies, that kind of thing from an ethical perspective. So I, I get it why there would be even less information on pregnant women compared to just women as a whole, but it does really anger me that it, you know, there are so many guidelines that are just based in men. I didn't realize that the pregnancy guidelines were based in men. That's, that's new information for me. So I'm just like, holy cow. Um, and then the second thing that comes to mind, which I feel like I don't want to go too far into, cause I feel like it could be a little controversial. Um, although if you want to talk about it where we can definitely talk about it is what I would call the myth that vegan diets are safe in pregnancy. Um, even vegetarian, I would maybe question depending on the animal food component of the diet. And now knowing that the protein requirements are so much higher and choline and B12, which we know B12 only comes from animal foods. I was never under the impression that veganism was safe in pregnancy or really the optimal diet for anybody for that matter. But now knowing that these um, guidelines are so off, I, I would really question and maybe I'm I'm guessing you agree with me just knowing you and knowing your research um but I'm I'm really questioning how anybody in the dietetics field could ethically approve of a vegan diet for a pregnant person so again I can like feel the possibility of <laughs> some anger from people who promote veganism or you know work no. with vegans but that that's the thing that comes to my mind when you're mentioning some of these um nutritional uh, you know, misunderstandings yeah. in the actual guidelines. So I will try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, so it is an ethical dilemma. And we find ourselves in a really interesting space in the state of dietetics where we're at right now. And just the state of, you know, the Eat Land Set recommendations and all of these organizations pushing for plant-based so heavily. Um, and you can take, you know, continuing education uh, webinars for dietitians on plant-based pregnancy. And here's the thing. My approach to prenatal nutrition is about reverse engineering 
like from what we know, from like the good data of what we know, I reverse engineer from a micronutrient, from the micronutrient level. These are the micronutrients that you need um, in, you know, these quantities, if we even have that data available, because I don't, I don't take the RDAs at face value. Um, where do you find those nutrients most in food? Because I'm looking at this from like an ancestral perspective. We didn't have vitamin B12 supplements until middle of the last century. You know, even, even when people were anemic back in the early 1900s, they, they couldn't give them B12 supplements because they didn't have them available. Um, they just started to have iron supplements available. They gave them liver. <laughs> so I just want to point this out that it's like, we're in a very new space in the span of less than a hundred years where we've even isolated and named nutrients and been able to synthesize them or put them in supplements and sell them and mass. So we're in a we're just in new territory. Um, but when you do that, you see that a lot of the nutrients that are most commonly deficient in pregnancy or needed in higher quantities in pregnancy are from foods of animal origin. Um, now I do have like a really, I have a blog post on my site on vegetarian diet and pregnancy nutrients of concern. I could have named that blog post, um, with like a very clickbait, title and I chose not to because I try to come at this angle from like a data first not um emotional level because otherwise people don't actually absorb the information they're giving you it feels like a personal attack on their dietary choices and I get it because I was vegetarian before I have friends and family members actually who are vegan so I completely understand like all the arguments around it but it comes down to four things and then I'll, I'll, we can move on to the next thing. Cause I know it's, um, this could get long. So I think that the main considerations for vegetarian diet come from a micronutrient standpoint. So point one, certain nutrients can be missing entirely. That'd be vitamin B12. Point two, certain nutrients might not be provided in sufficient concentrations in plant foods. And this would be choline, glycine, and vitamin K2. You'll note that, both glycine and vitamin K2 aren't even mentioned in conventional nutrition guidelines on prenatal nutrition whatsoever. So also going to point. Well, that I don't out. even, I, I don't know about you. I, we never talked about vitamin K2 in my graduate oh, program never. and that was only five years ago or something. Six, I, tried so. to do, I tried to do a research project. I was taking a graduate level vitamins class during my undergrad. It was a vitamins metabolism class that I talked my way into. And I tried to do a, a study on vitamin K2, like do a research presentation on it. And there wasn't enough research on it at the time. And this wasn't that long ago, right? We've just had an explosion of research on vitamin K2. But anyways, point three, certain nutrients might not be as well absorbed, such as iron and zinc. Point four, certain nutrients might not be provided in a form that is well utilized by the body. And the main two examples of this are omega-3s. So the ALA, which is the form that you get in plants versus DHA, how much is converted? Not enough. And we have abundant research showing that. Um, and the other example of this is vitamin A. Can you really get enough active vitamin A, retinol, vitamin A, um, from converting it from plant carotenes? And the answer is for most people, no. And especially when you have certain genetics that limit those conversions. So this gets into, it gets into like a lot of weeds that I don't think many people in the plant-based community are even considering. And when you look at what nutrients they even talk about in the conventional nutrition guidelines, they don't even mention some of these nutrients. Moreover, even as dietitians, we don't even learn about some of these genes that can impact conversion of nutrients. We don't have a whole lot of information, at least I didn't, about, I think maybe they touch on iron absorption and heme versus non-heme iron, but a lot of these nutrients aren't covered. So I think, I think people's recommendations around this aren't necessarily rooted in the science. And so what I try to do is just give people the <laughs> the, just the data on it. And it's up to you to make an informed decision. I do in, um, it's at the end of chapter three of real food for pregnancy, have a big section on this. And I have, I do include tips for people who choose to opt for a vegetarian diet 
um, some of the foods you might consider, or maybe some of like the leeway you'll give in your food choices where maybe you'll incorporate specific animal foods to fill in the gaps. Um, but I personally do not ethically endorse a vegan diet in pregnancy. So I, I don't have a vegan meal plan in the book. I don't even have a vegetarian meal plan in the book because I don't think it's optimal. Um, but I do think there is more wiggle room at meeting your nutrient needs mostly through foods, but you're going to need a lot of additional supplementation as well if it's vegetarian, meaning plant-based plus dairy and, and eggs. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with you. The goal is not to, you know, incite anger or offense or, you know, people being feeling like they're being personally attacked for their dietary preferences. But at the end of the day, we we can't remove ourselves from the laws of nature, right? Like just because you want to be a vegan does not mean that your body somehow is going to magically not need these nutrients anymore. And like you said, a lot of well-meaning dietitians and other healthcare professionals that are promoting plant-based diets for pregnancy, they it's very possible that they just may have unupdated information that they learned. Maybe they were in school 10 years ago. Maybe, you know, their school was somewhat behind. I mean, I went to one of the best nutrition schools in the country for my graduate program and there was still gaps, right? Like I was aware of gaps that were missing when, when I was learning, even though so much of it was really, you know, very evidence-based. So I don't think, you know, I try to take the perspective that I don't believe anybody is purposefully trying to harm anybody or, you know, it's not like a political agenda or something like that. I really do believe it really comes down to just a lack of information. And, um, you know, what you were saying about certain nutrients, not even being in plant foods all the way up to things like vitamin A, where, yeah, maybe some of the population can convert enough and maybe they'll be okay not getting preformed vitamin A from food. But if you are someone who is thinking about getting pregnant you know, planning on getting pregnant, friends and family planning on getting pregnant, I would want to know that, hey, there might be a risk that you cannot convert enough of this, you know, plant form of this nutrient into what your body actually needs to do all the processes that not only it needs for itself, but for growing another human, I would want to know. And then if they choose to move forward with a plant-based diet, that's up to them. Um, you know, I'm not going to take the position that that's like child abuse or something like that, which I know some I've seen some arguments that, you know, it goes beyond like, hey, it's your choice. It's really they're they're arguing that, no, that should not be you know permitted. So I don't think we're saying anything like that. I just want it to be a situation where people are informed. And again, it's not a fear based, um, informative uh, conversation. It's more just these are the facts. There's research to support this. If you want to check out Lily's book, I know she has. I'm not going to like, this is an over-exaggeration saying a million references, but there are a lot of references yeah. in the book that Over you can go look at yourself. Not a million. <laughs> 900's a lot. That's a lot. So um, just being able to see this from a purely objective perspective and not bringing emotions or, you know, like environmental beliefs or whatever kind of things that guide people's food decisions, just looking at it as purely what does the data say and going from there. So I really appreciate your, your level headed approach. And this can be pretty controversial because there are even in our profession, people that I'm sure would be very staunchly in disagreement with the, what we're talking about, but. Oh yes. I have been the subject <laughs> of um, hateful posts from plant-based dietitians who promote a plant-based uh, pregnancy. But um, all I can say is I just have to let the data speak for itself. And it's an informed consent decision. If you still want to go forward with a plant-based pregnancy, you have the information to do that. And you have, you know, the information on specific nutrients that might be lacking some supplementation um, ideas, because a lot of them just talk about iron and B12 and leave it at that. And you got to be talking about choline. You got to be talking about glycine. You have to be talking about some of these nutrients that don't, that aren't in the limelight as much yet, at least outside of like the functional medicine real food space where people have been talking about this a little more. Yeah. The, uh, paleo ancestral health RDs that, you know, we've been talking about this stuff for a while now and it's not like any of it's made up. It's very clearly, um, supported by the research that you've done. So, um, I'm hoping one day it'll get out into more of the mainstream, but for now, you know, 
it's more of a grassroots kind of educational movement that I'm sure you are majorly a part of. Um, so I feel like, and, and that could be maybe one of the big myths that we kind of like claim for this, this section is really just saying that plant-based, you know, the idea that plant-based is safe and effective for a healthy pregnancy is definitely questionable and possibly false. So, you know, again, we want people to be informed and feel open to do their own research. Look at the re- the references that Lily shares. Go look at the science yourself if you can understand it. Um, and then you get to make a decision on how you want to move forward. So, um, so, and I would love to just kind of switch gears a little bit because um, I feel like this is another, this is kind of a myth. Um, I don't know if it's so much of a myth as much as it is something that I see more often in the women that I work with. Because I work with a lot of women who are dealing with hypothalamic amenorrhea and PCOS as well, but a lot of them have more of the hypothalamic amenorrhea driven missing or irregular period. And many of them come to me because they want to get pregnant. And obviously if you're not having a period, it's going to be very, very difficult to get pregnant. Um, and something that I've noticed coming up a lot is, and I, <laughs> I'm trying to stay as level headed as you, because sometimes I honestly get really angry when I, when I hear what doctors are doing. Um, There's a lot of women that I've worked with whose doctors are kind of promoting fertility treatment to really push for fertility, kind of almost like force fertility on a woman who is clearly malnourished from not only a total calories or macros perspective, but I mean, it's very difficult to not be also micronutriently deficient if you are under eating and over exercising. So I get a lot of women who are like working through the process of recovering from HA and telling me that their doctor wants to start them on some kind of fertility medication that will, you know, force them to ovulate, force them to get pregnant, sustain the pregnancy. Um, So, you know, that's obviously a much more serious issue, but I think it kind of points to a bigger issue in our culture that prenatal nutrition does not include the time frame before you get pregnant. And, you know, just this conversation I'm having with my clients with amenorrhea, it really comes to light where doctors are like, let's just get you pregnant. And then you can worry about your nutrition once you get pregnant. So I think that's incredibly irresponsible and really dangerous to have that kind of approach to helping somebody get pregnant. And whether or not somebody's dealing with amenorrhea, I believe that if you ever want to get pregnant, if that's something that's on your radar for your future, that you need to be looking before, you know, day one of conception when it comes to your nutrition. So how much time does somebody really need to be spending focusing on their nutritional? I mean, not that it would ever be a bad thing to start, you know, 10 years ahead of time, but if somebody's thinking about getting pregnant, maybe they're just getting exposed to some of this information that we're talking about. They want to go get your book and they read it. How much time do you recommend giving a woman focusing on this nutritional, like increasing certain nutrients, getting her diet into a really healthy state before she should really start trying to actually conceive? Yeah, well, we are in agreement um, (laughs) as a whole, because I do think the focus does need to be more heavily on preconception nutrition. And I will say even at a public health, public policy level, I mean, I've been attending conferences for like over 10 years where they're talking about preconception and what's called interconception care between pregnancies. Like how do we reach women before they're actually pregnant, before they actually come in with the, yes, I had peed on a stick and it came out positive and here I am at eight, nine, 10, 12, 13, whatever weeks pregnant. Um, because a lot of this, very early development, embryonic development happens before you even know you're pregnant or in those early weeks after you've gotten a positive pregnancy test. Because remember how pregnancy is dated, it's dated from your last menstrual period. So by the time you find out you're pregnant, you're already technically four weeks pregnant, even though it's only two weeks ish post ovulation, obviously people have different length luteal phases. So it throws all the estimated due dates um, into question, but nonetheless, it's those early weeks where a lot is actually happening in um, development. So all of the internal organs and their basic structure is already formed by week eight or so of pregnancy. So if you're talking about, and since I have worked in the diabetes and pregnancy 
severe and there's more conversation about birth defects, which can be caused by um, excessively elevated blood sugar early on, these defects happen very, very early in those, usually in those first eight weeks, neural tube defects, for example, which can affect the whole population. It's not specific to um, elevated blood sugar in pregnancy. Again, that's before week 12, the neural tube closes. So all of these early processes are very heavily dependent on nutrition and on a person's general state of health, their hormone balance, um, having regular periods with sufficient bleeding um, is a sign that you have a, a sufficient endometrium um, built up. And that's actually what sustains early pregnancy until about week 10, that embryo is reliant on the endometrium for nourishment. There's some really interesting research coming out on that. And so this really comes back to what is happening beforehand. And I will say it's a, it sounds a bit radical, but there are some researchers um, when they look at some of the pregnancy nutrition interventions and say like, oh, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference what we do in pregnancy or not. And sure, maybe they could be doing better interventions, but some of these studies, um, the researchers actually come to the conclusion that it is pre-pregnancy health that has a greater impact on the trajectory of pregnancy, the risk of pregnancy complications and, and so forth, um, than actual the intervention happening during pregnancy. And I will say, it's not to say that we completely discount prenatal nutrition, it does matter, but for that early part of pregnancy, which is usually when nausea, vomiting, food aversions are happening, even if you want to be eating super well, even if you're like, okay, when I get pregnant, I'm going to eat so great. Um, you probably won't be able to for a period of time. Um, and it might be a couple months where you are kind of in survival mode. And that's, that's when the embryo is most reliant on this endometrium that you have built up. So how long should you wait or how long should you work on your nutrition beforehand? Um, I like to say that there's no bad time to embrace real food. There's never a bad time. If you just got a positive pregnancy test today and you're listening to this and now freaking out and pulling your hair out, don't, there's never a bad time. Um, can we say it's optimal to have not, you know, been incorporating more nutrient dense foods ahead of time? I mean, maybe not. Um, but the longer you go out, especially beyond like the three months preconception window, because that's really what it takes for like the, the whole egg to properly develop and be ready to be released for ovulation. If you can get that three month window, um, you're doing a, a, a really good job. If you can go beyond that, meaning you have been eating nutrient dense foods for years and years and regularly cycling for a long time, and you've ditched hormonal contraception a long time ago and sort of, you know, rebuilt your nutrient stores because we know hormonal birth control can kind of play a role in some nutrient deficiencies all the better. Um, but I would at least give a three month window where you're putting, you know, extra attention on it. And it doesn't have to be like, I have some people reach out where they're like, so I went off the wagon and I totally messed up. So like, do I need to restart like my preconception? I'm like, no, like nobody cares that you had chocolate cake <laughs> like last weekend. It doesn't matter. It's more about these changes, these choices that you're consistently making over time. Like every bite of nutrient dense food counts and is not um, undone by having chocolate cake or like having a treat or whatever. It's more about like the totality of, oh good, you're including more choline rich foods in your diet. Oh good, you have made a choice to have more vitamin B12 rich foods. Oh good, you're focusing on, you know, having enough protein so you're not starving or, you know, to your point, just eating enough calories, period. Um, not overtraining, like letting your body rest enough so you can cycle normally. Like all of those choices are, additive and the longer the better but three months would be my my minimum minimum recommendation um if you have the the luxury of planning the pregnancy right and i think it comes back to that idea of it's less about avoidance as it is about adding things that inclusion. are 
Yeah. hundred percent. And, and I feel like, cause like you said, chocolate cake, probably not the most nutrient dense food for most people, depending on how you're making it. And it's, you know, as long as you're not having chocolate cake in lieu of, you know, animal proteins, organ meats, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, you really should be okay versus, um, you know, having that mindset of what do I need to avoid? What do I need to take out? Oh my gosh, I can't have sugar because sugar's so bad for you. It's like, if you have a little sugar on top of a really high quality diet, that's really not that big of a deal. So, um, and for most people totally fine. So, um, I'm glad that you mentioned it because again, the idea is don't worry so much about trying to restrict or avoid, think more about what can I add? What can I emphasize to really get that nutrient dense diet? And then anything else I eat on top of it, it's kind of like, all right, enjoy yourself. Don't worry so much. Um, but I am glad you mentioned that three month timeline because that is generally what I tell my clients. And again, everybody gets, it's kind of like the same thing with the vegan conversation. You get to do what you feel is best for you. If you're not comfortable or willing to wait to have I always say I have three regular menstrual cycles before actively trying to conceive. Um, not to say that if you accidentally get pregnant, like we're, we're not saying that you need to do anything about a pregnancy that was unplanned. Like we're just saying that if you have the luxury of making some choices about timing and, you know, timing intercourse, having unprotected intercourse around certain times of the month where you're actually actively trying to get pregnant, if you're not menstruating, it's a sign that there's something going on. Um, I think that's really important that you mentioned the endometrial tissue development and how much that's being produced. And if you're not menstruating, you can pretty much guarantee that you're not building up much of an endometrial lining. Um, also, you're not going to be producing much progesterone after if you're not ovulating and progesterone is very important for sustaining a pregnancy. So, you know, we're really looking at that your health during a pregnancy. How is that impacted by rushing into something that your body's not ready for? How is your baby's health affected? Is the, is the sustainability of the pregnancy going to be affected? So, you know, if your miscarriage risk is so much higher going into a pregnancy where you're not menstruating, I, like I said, I would want to know that if that was something that I was, um, making decisions around. So again, we're not saying any of this to shame anybody or tell you, you cannot have a baby unless you've had three natural menstrual cycles, but I think it's a really important thing to be watching for. And for the ladies out there that are dealing with hypothalamic amenorrhea, this is something that if you want to get pregnant, it needs to be part of the decision-making process. So I'm glad that you gave that um, thorough explanation as to why this needs to be, we're ne we're, we need to look at this before somebody gets pregnant, not just like, let's just get you pregnant and then figure it out later. And not only that, but just to add really quickly, since I am, you know, still postpartum, I think seven months postpartum still counts as like relatively early postpartum, uh, pregnancy and postpartum recovery and caring for an infant. And especially if you're breastfeeding, that also takes a toll on your body nutritionally. It's hard on your adrenals, you know, sleep is interrupted for a long, long time. Um, and those are things where if you enter pregnancy with, you know, good thyroid health, because your thyroid has to do a heck of a lot of work in pregnancy and a lot of remodeling postpartum. If your adrenals are happy, if you're generally, you know, have some nutrient stores to rely on your postpartum recovery, your postpartum mental health, like all the things are better. <laughs> so it's not just the short term of the pregnancy. I think people need to be thinking um, long term as well. And, and definitely postpartum recovery is like a really, um, under discussed, um, area. And I think it, it all comes back to before the pregnancy, which yeah. sounds crazy, but like, really it all comes back to like a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so th it is helpful to keep that in mind as well. Is that, so is that, um, is there research to support that? Or do you feel like that's more of an anecdotal um, just thing that you see in a lot of the people you work with? So both. Okay. Um, I have like a really detailed, like it's like a 90 minute, two hour ish webinar all, all about postpartum recovery and nutrient repletion where I go into the data we have and then the lack of data we have because studies on um, postpartum tend to be they don't do a lot of studies on postpartum women. Really? Let's just put Shocking. It that way. Shocking. And 
And to point out, like, we don't even have good guidelines on, like, the guidelines for pregnancy are one thing. The guidelines for postpartum are essentially non-existent. All we have is guidelines for breastfeeding, which only assumes, um, which only technically applies to the first six months of breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding. Then beyond that, they don't, there's nothing. And then what about the women who are not breastfeeding, but are early postpartum? There's like nothing. The only difference they have is the iron recommendations. Um, so there is like a dearth of data on postpartum, but if we can think about it from like a logical physiologic perspective, um, clinical experience, and then just, I mean, being a common sense human being like, okay, we are observing crazy amounts of postpartum thyroid dysfunction. Why might that be happening? And what could we do to get that better in balance. Oh, weird. A lot of it comes down to nutrition. Hmm. Why are we seeing so much postpartum anemia going on? Oh, wait, that relates to the thyroid. Oh, wait, that relates to that. I mean, I, what are we seeing in the nutrient levels in breast milk? Oh, hmm, 60% of women are low in vitamin A in their breast milk, even in like well-nourished quote, well-nourished, um, you know, developed countries where they have plenty of access to vitamin A rich foods. Hmm. What's going on here? I mean, you can kind of take the ag aggregate of all of the, that data and all of these observations and come to the conclusion that we need to be doing more for <laughs> postpartum health. Um, but I would say it's a mix to, to answer the question. Yeah. And I'm, I don't ever want people to think that the only information we should be looking at is, you know, randomized controlled trials or something like that. Yes, that's important to have. And certainly I'm not opposed to using that when we're making decisions. Um, but sometimes, like you said, there isn't information to really go on. And like you said, sometimes it really comes down to common sense. And if you've worked with enough clients and you've seen patterns, I think those patterns are, you know, they're, they're meaningful. It's not just Oh, it's just anecdotal. So it doesn't count. So, um, and the reason I asked you is because, um, I, I always want to make sure I'm telling people that are things that are accurate. And I feel like in my gut, I was like, this, this has to be the case, but I do find that a lot of the women that come to me with postpartum anxiety, depression, um, like you said, anemia, thyroid dysregulation, a lot of times they're habits leading into the pregnancy and maybe even during the pregnancy were not ones that would support their optimal nutritional state postpartum. And I think that's so important to talk about because we look so much at the health of the baby and like, you know, and not that any of that's not important as well, but I really think postpartum women kind of get the shaft when it comes to like, you know, making <laughs> sure that board. people, <laughs> right. To, to, yeah. When it comes to making sure that they're happy, healthy and, oh, you're anxious, take some medication. You're depressed, take some medication. You have thyroid issues. Well, unless it's totally clinically elevated, don't worry about it or take some medication. And I just think it's a big, it's, it's really heartbreaking and it's, Again, I get a little angry when I hear what my, my clients are being told by their doctors, but um, it all comes back to, you know, women that want to start a family to have a baby. You don't go into a pregnancy wanting to experience postpartum mental health challenges. You want, and I'm not saying that it's a person's fault or that like if it happens, you should have done something differently, but anything that we can do to set a woman up for the healthiest postpartum experience possible I think is our obligation as clinicians. And I think it's something that women don't even know that they should be advocating for, or don't even know that they should be thinking about because they're so focused on the getting pregnant piece. And I just, I'm glad we're talking about it. And I feel like I keep saying that, but I am really glad we're talking about it because it is something that I've been telling a lot of my women in my get your period back program that are talking about wanting to like start fertility treatment and Again, informed consent if they want to go through with a treatment before they've really gotten to a place where their body is functioning normally, that's their choice. But I want them to know that there is a risk postpartum that they could be experiencing more severe mental health challenges, even with all the challenges of being a new mom, right? So anything we can do to make, make their experience better, I think it's just, you know, that's what everyone wants to have when they get pregnant and have a baby. They want to have that bonding and, you know, joyful experience. And I think it's really doing a disservice if we don't talk about, you know, the things that can improve the chances of that happening. I like to use the, um, the phrase stack the deck in your favor 
because I think a lot of people feel like what happens to them and their body during pregnancy or postpartum is completely out of their control. And some of it is out of your control. I mean, pregnancy, postpartum, motherhood, like name of the game is surrender because nothing is in your, (laughs) is in your total control. Um, but we do have data that shows that we can stack the deck in our favor. We can stack the deck in reducing the chances of pregnancy complications by reducing the chances of pregnancy complications. You're going to reduce your chances of birth complications, which is going to reduce your chances of birth trauma, which is going to reduce your chances of, you know, postpartum mental health issues. I mean, stress has a massive effect on, on all of this as a whole. It's not just like nutrition only. Um, but if we can take these little bits of information and sort of piece together the ways that we can optimize our outcomes, even if they're not in our complete control, all the better, because when something does arise, you can say, well, at least I know I did as much as I could. And, you know, for example, I, a lot of my work is with gestational diabetes and that's like a lot of people are completely distraught getting that diagnosis and they want to play like the why me game and what did I do wrong? And, you know, if you have done all the things that you can to try to prevent it and you understand that it's not entirely um, preventable, Um, at least you have that peace of mind where it's like, okay, I did my part and now I'm going to make the best decisions I can moving forward. And I mean, that really is the case with everything in life, right? But (laughs) pregnancy, postpartum, um, definitely applies. Well, it's funny. I'm like, man, we have a lot of questions that I prepared that are not going to be gotten to. Um, We'll have to have you on in the future again, Lily, because even just selfishly, I like picking your brain about this kind of stuff and seeing what your perspective is. Um, I think one of the last questions I wanted to ask you since, like I said, I think we've gotten through like three questions that I had 10 prepared. (laughs) I knew going in, I was like, there's no way, there's no way we're going to cover all of these. Um, what I want to kind of end our conversation with is um, some practical steps and some hope for people, because I think a lot of what we focused on is stuff that can go wrong or stuff that isn't really getting the attention it deserves in the research or, you know, misconceptions that are unfortunately being shared even by um, prenatal physicians. All of that said, I know you have two beautiful, amazing books that people can check out. Um, and I certainly will link to them in the notes and I strongly encourage people to get those books. If somebody wants to just have a foundational, what are some main things to focus on both before getting pregnant and then during pregnancy, especially for women that maybe don't have, um, a huge budget to be spending on grass fed, everything and organic, everything, where would you say women would get the biggest bang for their buck focusing on when it comes to food choices, um, pre and, and well, preconception and then prenatal. So what I would say is again, coming at it from like the pushing micronutrients first, I would come at it from what are the most nutrient dense foods that give you like the biggest nutritional bang for your buck. And, you know, we can have full conversations about food quality. We can also have full conversations about just the whole food itself, regardless of how it was produced is like still going to be nutrient dense. So taking it from that angle, I would prioritize eggs. They tend to be relatively inexpensive or they can be, um, sometimes depending on where you live in the country, you might find somebody who has backyard chickens who sells you a dozen for like three bucks, like great. (laughs) They're like, you know, really fantastic. But even generic supermarket eggs are still really nutrient dense. It's going to be like your, your biggest source of choline, um, in your diet by far. I would, prioritize. I'm going to like start with the animal foods because they, they really are like the ones that have most of the micronutrients that you need to be thinking about for fertility. Um, and then on the macronutrient side tend to be, you know, great sources of blood sugar balancing 
fat and protein. So whether you're coming at it at the angle from PCOS with some possible insulin resistance going on or coming at it from the HA undernourished standpoint and just maintaining like level happy blood sugar levels um, throughout the day, those things are still important. So aside from eggs, I would say um, you can chop the sales section at your grocery store, see what meat is on sale for the week. Sometimes they put like the grass fed meat on sale. So check that out too. Um, the tougher cuts of meat that require slow cooking. So like a chuck roast or something, those are usually much less expensive than a steak or you know, boneless, skinless chicken breast, if you can get like a whole bird or pieces of the bird, like drumsticks, thighs, bone in, skin on, those are less expensive um, and actually more nutrient dense when we talk about, you know, glycine and collagen, which we didn't get into in a lot of detail today. Um, those are your best sources. And after you've cooked your chicken or chicken parts, you save the bones, save any of like the knuckle parts, tough parts, um, the skin, if you don't want to eat it and throw that all in the stock pot and make bone broth. And that's essentially free. Um, I'm like very, very, very frugal when it comes to, um, food. So I, I, although I do, um, I'm lucky to have the privilege to be able to buy you know, more like the, you know, the grass fed and whatever cuts when I can, I'm also like use all the parts own my grandma skills kind of a person. So I would never, not to say that this is a bad thing, but I don't personally purchase bone broth at like $10 for a tiny, like a pint, like what the heck you can make a whole court for free from like just buying bone in meat and then saving the bones in a bag in your freezer. When you fill a gallon bag with bones, you throw it in your slow cooker, your, your stock pot, your instant pot, whatever, and make broth and it's free food. Um, I would also say foods like canned fish. So like canned sardines, um, canned oysters, canned clams, incredibly nutrient dense. you got your omega threes, your B12, your iron, your zinc, your selenium, your iodine. There's so much good stuff. And that's a really inexpensive way to incorporate it into your diet. So you don't have to do the, you know, wild Alaskan salmon filet. That's like 20, 30 bucks. You can get like a $2 can of sardines or like a $1 can of oysters even if it's packed in not the best oil, like I don't care. I think the nutritional benefits, the micronutrient content in it um, outweighs any of the not perfect oil that it's packed in. And then other, other things I think that can be really helpful for shopping on a budget would be seeing what's available in your local food space. Um, and again, this could be challenging if you, you know, you're in a position where you're working really long hours and don't necessarily have access or transport to get to a farmer's market or whatever. But if you live near farms, a lot of times you can get produce for much less expensive um, when it's in season. So I'm, I'm a big fan of shopping in season and locally. It doesn't have to be transported um, super far. It doesn't have to be organic. It's still, in my opinion, better if it's you know, fresher from the earth than is organic and has been sitting on the shelf for three weeks, you know? Um, so whatever you can make happen in your local food space, it, at least explore that option and see if in your area it is less expensive. It definitely varies place to place, but if you're in an agrarian area, then take advantage of that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I know you were mentioning before, um, that is also usually very inexpensive is organ meat. Not the most delicious necessarily, but um, certainly when we're talking about cheap cuts. <laughs> and have you had heart before? Yes. And? It's uh, it's not bad. I feel like I haven't had it in a really long How time. How you have it prepared? I probably overcooked it. I feel like that's the death of all organ meats is being overcooked. So yeah, so organ meats, like fantastic, like very, very micronutrient dense. And I think a lot of people focus mostly on liver and I know you're not a super fan of liver. I mean, I'm not a fan of eating straight up liver. I like make pate and hide it in ground meat recipes. So there's several re recipes on my website. There's more in real food for pregnancy where you hide liver in other ground meat dishes. So it's less livery because you know it has a very 
has a very iron sort of metallic um, flavor that people don't like. Um, but heart is like that. I feel like it's a good gateway meat organ meat for people because it doesn't have like the strong flavor that liver has, at least not to the same degree. I mean, it's very high iron. So you do have a bit of an iron flavor, but, um, I have a recipe on my website for, um, Thai chili beef heart skewers. And it's kind of the way that they make, um, beef heart, um, from what I hear in Argentina, where it's like cut thin, marinated, and then cooked over a fire. And I don't know, maybe it's something about the little char you get on the edge, but if you get like a solid, nice marinade with it, it's, delicious, like surprisingly delicious. So, you know, if liver's scary, look at getting heart and it's amazing. You can get organ meats for, I mean, dirt cheap, so cheap. I mean, now they're getting a little more expensive because it's like becoming in, in vogue. To <laughs> it's, organ yeah. It's kind of like buying beef um, bones. It's like, it used to be like, you could get them almost given to you like, oh, they're just dog exactly. bones, but now they're sold for like $7 a pound or something at Whole Foods. Oh, so. it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And I, the only reason why I brought that up is because it's something that, you know, it's, I, I'm not a huge organ meat fan from a flavor perspective. I've had it before where it tastes good. My mom actually just made a meatloaf that had liver in it a few days ago and other than the texture being a little mush mushier than I usually like for a meatloaf, it was actually pretty good. And so I think being willing to experiment and test things out, cause it's like, yeah, you could maybe do like liver capsules if you really, really hate the taste, but that's so much more expensive. Way expensive. Yeah. Personally, I would never buy liver cap. I know like, again, like I don't want to make people feel bad about their choices because some people that is, they're not going to eat organ meats and that is, you know, the only option. So I, I think they are an option, but from a budget standpoint with me being like so frugal with my food, um, I cannot justify buying a $30 thing of liver capsules when I can get, I mean, we do like a meat share from like a, a local rancher. And by the way, that's another way to make your meat much less expensive for us. It works out to about $5 a pound and yeah, it's not all steaks, but that's how you can get some of these fancier cuts for essentially very inexpensive. And they also just give you the bones and give you the organs. Um, so that's, you know, a cool option. You do need like a big, you know, freezer space for it. But if you can, if you can absorb that one time big cost, um, that is one way to get quality meat for less expensive. Well, and I think at the end of the day, people need to just decide between, I mean, you're always choosing between money and time. I feel like for pretty much every decision that we make of investing in something, it's always deciding, do you want to spend your time doing this or do you want to spend your money to make it convenient? And I look at something like, um, you know, boxed bone broth or liver capsules as if that's the only way it's going to happen because you don't have the time. And, I, and I'm not, I actually use a lot of box bone broth because I am pretty busy and, you know, my husband works full time. And so I'm, I'd rather just get it and yeah, pay an exorbitant amount of money for it because it means I'm going to get it versus being like, well, I don't have time right now to make bone broth. And that means I'm not going to have it. So I think no matter what end of the spectrum somebody's coming from, you have options. You get to either spend extra time to do the cooking yourself, do a little bit of, you know, research to find a local provider that can get you better prices or, you know, discount bulk purchases. Or, you know, if you're somebody who works 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week and lives in a studio apartment in New York City, maybe doing box bone broth and liver pills is actually going to be the right choice for you. So um, obviously the question was how to do it more frugally and how to like get the best bang for your buck nutritionally. And either way, organ meats are still going to be cheaper than a filet mignon or something that doesn't even have the same nutritional quality. So at the end, at the end of the day, we just want you to do what's best for you, do what's best for your body, um, have the information to make those choices. And then, you know, if you, if you want the convenience of ordering something, I mean, even there's certain companies, like I think U S wellness meat sells, uh, like a meatloaf mix that has liver in it. And there might be other providers that do it too. Yeah. And they have like liver worst and some other like sort of sausagey things that you can slice and eat that have liver or organ meats mixed into them as well. Um, I haven't ordered from them before, but I hear them mentioned quite a bit. So yeah. yeah, I've, I've done their liver worse before. It's, it's 
good. It's I have a really hard time using it all when I order it because oh. I always like order it in bulk. So I'm like, well, if I'm going to order it, I might as well get a bunch. And then it sits in my freezer for way too long. So I'm like the worst at <laughs> making sure that gets eaten. But um, but everybody I, I think the whole point is to say that everybody has options, whether you are you know, on food stamps and you're using those food stamps to get liver from the grocery store. Or if you're somebody who, again, lives in a studio apartment, doesn't even have time to cook and you're taking liver pills to get those nutrients in. So there's no wrong way to do it. And I think just knowing knowing how to do it in a variety of ways is going to be really beneficial. Now, I want to respect your time because I know that you're a busy person and you got some kids that are, I'm sure, wanting your attention. So, um, I will have to have you on again because, again, we got to about 30% of what I had <laughs> questions for you about. And you have such a depth of knowledge and it's just really fun to get to chat with you about these things. The question I ask every person that comes on the show, um, I, I like to throw a little curveball if you're not a regular listener, is um, what do you believe makes a person more than a body? Ooh. Oh boy, this is quite the curveball. I thought you were going to ask what I had for breakfast or something. No, I don't. <laughs> I like to go deep, <laughs> just cut right deep into it. <laughs> and the caveat is always that there's no wrong answer. I feel like it's the the heart that you bring to your interactions with people, your family, your work, um, like your why you can't put that in a box, right? You can't sell that. It's, I think it's the heart that you bring to everything you do in your life. I love it. And the reason I asked that question, I get the different opinion from everybody on the show is to just kind of remind everyone that as much as we're talking about, you know, biology and nutrition and physical health and all of that, at the end of the day, you're, you know, who you are and your spirit and your relationships with your loved ones is the most important thing and any decision we make around nutrition should always keep that stuff in mind. So um, thanks for playing. Like I said, I know it can sometimes throw people off when they're like, where did that come from? But um, it's just a little <laughs> thing I throw in at the end. So all that said, again, I'm going to post information about your books and your blog. Um, where can people find you on the internet if they want to learn more about all of this really interesting and important guidelines for um, prenatal, postnatal, postpartum, I guess I should say, and uh, children's nutrition that you share. Yeah, so you can read my blog over on my website, lilynicholsrdn.com. Uh, there's, you know, I've been blogging for a long time. It is way less frequent these days um, with kids and all the things, but there's, you know, 250 plus articles up there. Um, so there's a search function. You can search for specific topics if you don't want to go through page by page by page by page what's on there. Uh, there's also the press page lists um, interviews I've been on if you want to listen to other podcasts. As far as, oh, and on my website also for people who want more um, info on Real Food for Pregnancy, there is the first chapter available for free as a download. There's a freebies tab, so it's easy to find. So if you just want to get sort of like more information on like, hmm, the guidelines aren't what they are. What's this real food thing? Like, what should I be thinking about? You can just get a sneak peek of that um, without having to actually like buy the book. Uh, and then social media wise, I'm on all the regular channels, but I'm most active these days on Instagram. So my handle is the same as my website, which is Lily Nichols RDN. Awesome. Well, like I said, I will post all of those in the show notes below this episode on laurashoenfeldrd.com. Lily, thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise and um, just giving people a place to start with their prenatal nutrition and understanding why it's so valuable for them, not only for their own health, but for their baby's health as well. And I just really respect you and your um, commitment to the research and your focus on facts over fear and you know just all the amazing resources that you have to share with the world on a topic that is not anywhere near researched enough so <laughs> yeah. thank you again and um like i said i'll i'll definitely be inviting lily back so next time um i don't maybe we'll get to the second half of the prenatal interview or yeah, we'll right. talk about something else but uh, i really appreciate your time you bet i'd be happy to come back and thank you for your time and your work as well 
Awesome. Well, and thanks to everybody for hanging out with us over the last hour plus. And I will look forward to seeing you all here next time on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Hey there, Laura here again. Thank you so much for listening to the Fed and Fearless podcast. Your time is your most precious resource, and I'm so grateful that you choose to spend some of it with me. Now, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to continue supporting my work on this show, I would very much appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes. By leaving a five-star review, you'll help others find the show and help me spread my message to a larger audience. You can go to fedandfearless.com forward slash review to find a button that'll take you right to iTunes to leave your review. And I have a special gift for you as a thank you for helping me share the podcast. Once you leave your review, send a screenshot of the review to hello at lauraschoenfeldrd.com or you can DM it to me on Instagram at lauraschoenfeldrd. Once you do, I'll share a free copy of my Overcoming Undereating ebook. Then share a favorite podcast episode in your Instagram stories and tag me at Laura Schoenfeld RD. And I'll also give you a free copy of my 14 day calorie challenge recipe guide. Together, these bonuses are worth $44 and will help you become fed and fearless. And you'll get them absolutely free for just helping me grow the podcast. Again, thank you so much for your support and I'll see you here next week for the latest episode. 